Yeah, welcome back to the ThinkTech. This is Global Connections. We're going to talk to Seymour Kazimersky on trying to understand the terror attack on Israel. It's a few days now, and the world has changed. There are changes in the United States. There are changes in, in Ukraine and Russia. There are changes everywhere. And we change. We change our perception over time. Our first perception is outrage. Our second perception is what happened here. Our third perception is uh, how have people been affected? Our fourth perception is what do we do now to avoid something worse? And and the bottom line is um, people died. They were murdered. It's like the Holocaust. And we have to figure out what it means, what it means to us and them. Because, you know, those who didn't survive cannot speak to it. So Seymour Kazimersky has been teaching the Holocaust in Hawaii. He's a, sort of the voice of what happened in the Holocaust, trying to educate school kids and everyone else about what happened in the Holocaust and what it means. And, and in that process, uh, for 40 years, he's been trying to understand it so he can speak to it. And now, you know, we said never again. It's kind of like again. Uh, so Seymour, I really did want to talk to you to find out how you're feeling, how you're reacting. Um, what is going through your mind on this? Well, Jay, uh, thank you for inviting me to come on the show. But it's so emotional. It's so terrible to believe that we're experiencing basically another Holocaust in another form. And everything that I teach is all based on understanding hatred and intolerance. And the hatred that Hamas has for Israel, the hatred that Hezbollah has, that, that, that Iran has, where their sole goal is to annihilate the people of Israel, to put them into the ocean, to make sure there's no Israel. So it bothers me to such an extent that we are trying to make peace with groups that don't understand the word peace. And it bothers me that we've tried so hard for 50 years now to try to make peace with these people. And it's not the people. You have to understand it's groups of people. It's the people at the head of Hamas and Hezbollah. I'm not blaming all the Palestinians. I'm not blaming the West Bank people or even the Iranian people themselves. The leaders are so corrupt and so vile that they sanction what we just saw in the last few days. Jay, it's, it's terrifying. It bothers me terribly. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a hybrid war. It's a war on, of course, um, land, sea, and air, but it's also a war um, in social media. It's a war in the press. And I'm afraid that uh, there are a lot of people in the conventional media that do not understand. I saw an interview with Cory Booker um, today, who just got back from Israel. He understands. He completely understands. If he were here with us today, he would be agreeing with what you just said. Uh, and I admire him greatly. I, it's a long shot, but I would like to see him as Speaker of the House for that reason. Um, but let me let me say, though, that, um, you know, I thought at the outset that let's not let the press get hold of this. Let's just go into Gaza and do what we have to do. And they can think about it later. Um, instead, Israel has held up, probably because a lot of people have said, don't don't go into Gaza. You know, you can bomb it. You already started bombing it. Uh, but don't don't do a ground uh, invasion of Gaza because it'll be very messy and loss of life on both sides and loss of, mm, you know, public opinion and all that. But I really wondered at the time, this is within a day or two after, uh, whether the right move conventionally, classically, would have been for them to, you know, get their act together and go in and find the terrorists and kill them. Um, well, it's too late for that now, but I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, frankly, I think there's a, you're, you're correct, but there is another aspect to this. We learned in this in the last four or five days that Hamas and Iran have, have technological warfare 
they understand exactly what they're doing. And I disagree with you with one point. If we went into Gaza today, we don't know how many bunker bombs there are. We don't know how many missiles that, that they could throw at our so at the Israeli soldiers coming in. We don't know about all of the 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 technology warfare that they have currently used that they can use. Israel must do the bombing that they are doing now and go in when it's a little bit safer. I believe that if we want to try to get our hostages back, Israel is doing the right thing. You want power, you want food, you want electricity, give us back our hostages. If you want to suffer, you're going to suffer. And I feel for the Palestinian people, Jay, you know it there are many, many times. And every single time I go, I feel that the people, the Palestinian people, have, have been under the thumb of Hamas. 30 years now, Hamas has been on top of Palestinian people, and they have not, they, they haven't revolted. They haven't decided that they want to get rid of Hamas, that they want to make peace with Israel. So we need to understand that the Palestinian people have very little choice. But the choice now is get out of the way. We're coming in. We're going to clean out Hamas. Netanyahu said something that I think in a very few short words really explains it. You started the war. We're going to finish it. And I think that is going to have a tremendous amount of suffering on, uh, on the Palestinian people. If Egypt opens up the border at Rafah, and I understand that they're really talking about it now, and they will accept the refugees, just like Poland accepted the refugees from the Ukraine in the last year. If they do that, then the Palestinians can go there, the Israelis can come in, clean out Hamas, and then hopefully we can start a state solution of two people living together. But until then, Jay, remember what I said at the beginning. They hatred, that hatred and intolerance. You, after all of the years, all of the generations, all of the teachings that they teach their children to hate Jews and to hate Israelis, you, that's not going away. That's going to take education and it's going to take time. So I don't think there's an easy solution here. No, I agree. They've been teaching hatred to the Palestinians and, you know, to the extreme, the Hamas. Um, and when you teach a kid something like that, it sticks. It sticks for that kid's whole life. And so, you know, you talk about it's going to take time. Where do you, where do, you do, um, you know, social modification? Where do you take that same kid who's now imbued with hatred? That's all he thinks about killing Jews, killing the state of Israel, sweeping all the Jews into the sea. He's been learning that his whole life. And you're going to change his way of thinking? It's a long shot. Um, a very, very long shot, Jay. And more important, he's got the backing of people above him that say, we can do it. You know, we can we can do this to Israel. Look, the Nazis tried to do it. Hitler tried to do it. And we defeated them. Uh, my mother had a very famous saying when she was she she was a Holocaust survivor. As you know, she's passed on. And when she was interviewed and and the interviewer said to her, Mrs. Kazimersky, how are you so positive? And she looked at him straight in the eye and she says, don't you understand? I won the war. There's no more Nazis. I won the war. And that's what we have to look at. We have to look at the ability. We have to take the next step, get rid of Hamas. And I'm hoping that we go further, Jay. I'm hoping we get rid of Hezbollah. Now, you don't want to start me on Iran because, you know, I can go crazy when I talk about what Iran really wants to do. But if we can get rid of Hamas and we can get rid of Hezbollah, we can start to re-educate the people that Israelis are not bad people. We want to live side by side. But if you insist that you want us to be annihilated, that the hatred is so great that there's no way that we can work together, live together, there's no peace. No. I'm reminded uh, by the fact that every war from 1948 on has been started or incipiently started. Um, you know, by, by the Arabs, by the Palestinians, by Hamas and Hezbollah, every single time. 
And uh, Israel has been essentially on the defensive all these years. <clears throat> the difference this time, however, uh, is the level of atrocity, the level of technology, the level of cooperation and nuanced strategies with uh, countries like uh, Iran. And I believe that Russia, Putin, is also involved in this. It serves his interest to be involved. Um, so the, you know, the Israelis have a bigger problem than they ever had before, ever. And they have taken more casualties uh, than they have ever taken before. So I'm not as optimistic. I do not necessarily see any light at the end of this tunnel. I think a lot of people are going to die, including uh, Israelis um, and and the Palestinians. Um, and I don't know how to prevent that one way or the other. I, I wouldn't give you a, a, a big bet on the hostages getting out either. Um, it's a long shot. This is all a long shot. And I don't know if there's a clear strategy or whether Israel knows of a clear strategy. We are in, in spasm here. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, and we do have a, a few minutes to spend on this, is the reaction uh, in the country, in, in the United States, um, the reaction in Congress to the extent we know what Congress is doing these days, and the reaction on the college campuses, or, or shall I say the university campuses, some of the biggest, best universities in the country have failed to find a moral compass, compass on this. And I find that extraordinary and an example of a an abiding anti-Semitism. No other word would, would apply, but I wonder what your thoughts are. Anti-Semitism is growing. You, you know that, I know that. Uh, every time we say that anti-Semitism is growing, we have to understand why, Jay. What is happening on these college campuses? What is happening on social media? The ability to say whatever you want to say. Take the Harvard, the, the Harvard position. All of a sudden, all these guys who signed on to a petition and said, you know, the, uh, this whole war is the fault of the Israelis. None of them want their names printed. No, they're all afraid that they can't get jobs now. Well, guess what, everybody? It's time to own up. If you feel that strongly about your position, then you better be able to take that position and defend it. The anti-Semitism issue is just as great here in Hawaii believe it or not. I just got called to a school, I won't name this school, because they had swastikas on the walls of the school. You mean now? And they wanted me uh, just, just three, three months ago. And they had swastikas on the walls of, of the school. They said, can you come and talk to our kids? And I said, of course I will. And I talked to the kids and I explained to them what a swastika really meant. But it's not the, the meaning of the swastika. It's what's behind it. It's what happened. And when I give them the story of it and I say to them, if you saw a young girl almost raped by two boys at the side of the school, what are you going to do? Are you going to try to stop them and say you can't do that? You're going to go to your teacher? You're going to go to your parents? Or are you going to do nothing? And 300 students said, nothing, Jay. And all of a sudden, the three or four kids put their hands up and they said, I'm going to tell them not to do it. And I said, stand up and say, you can't do it so everybody can hear. And they said, you can't do it. And guess what, Shay? At the end, I had 300 kids standing up shouting, you can't do it. So they understood the power that they can have by doing the right thing. Because the true answer to your question is, you are either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And I wanted these kids to understand that they have to be part of the solution. And that's why we continue to do the education we do. Because if we don't educate the people, there are kids. Anti-Semitism continues. It grows. And it's not just anti-Semitism. It's all the other antis that you have as well. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that we as Jewish educators or Holocaust educators, it is important for us not just to teach about the Holocaust, but to teach about bullying, intolerance, hatred, all those pieces of the puzzle that make life worth living. And we that's what we do. I wish there were more Seymour Kazimerskis around, but the fact is there aren't. And the fact is that just like those Arab kids who spend their life in school, to the extent you could say what they do is go to school, 
um, they learn hatred. That's what they learn. And if you look across these United States um, to schools that do not teach civics, that do not teach the rule of law or democracy, or even, you know, fairness, equity, consideration of the other guy, caring, what all those basic principles in, in Christianity, if you will, you don't even have to get to Judaism. Um, they're untrained. Um, and then you go, you know, to the Fertile Crescent and the Middle East, and you say, well, that's on the far side of the coin, because they're trained all right. They're trained for hatred. So this is all really globally a matter of education. You can teach a given population how to love, how to care, how to be considerate, how to follow, you know, the, the scruples in the Bible uh, and in any religion, any, any religion, really. Um, or you can teach them to hate. And th it sticks with them like glue. And I think right now we, ha we have passed a kind of turning point where in this country we don't know about those things because there's not enough Seymour Kazimerskis around. Um, and we don't, certainly we don't know about that, those kinds of things in, in the Middle East. Um, because uh, there are not enough Seymour Kazimerskis around. Maybe uh -huh. <laughs> well, Jay, Jay, let me tell you, first of all, the, the thank heaven there's only one Seymour Kazimerski. You don't want more like that. <laughs> but what we are doing here in Hawaii and what is being done around the country, my sister, for instance, she's doing a program in Canada on genocide. Uh, I'm going to continue my program here with the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and we're going to have a bus that's going to go to all the schools here in the state of Hawaii that's going to talk about intolerance, hatred, but not just about the Holocaust, but helping the kids understand one word. What does humanity really mean? What does man's inhumanity really mean? And if we can do that, if I can bring that education perspective to them, I know for a fact that we're going to change lives here, one, uh, one at a time. It, it may take many, many, many years to do, Jay. But if we don't change right now, if we don't educate our kids a lot better than we're doing, then we are doomed to continue to doing the same thing we have now. All these 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 hate issues that we have, uh, all, uh, all of this anti-Semitism, it's very, 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 it's a dire situation. I want you to know that I admire you greatly uh, for doing this all your life, all your life. And it, it's not just a matter of honoring your family. It's more. Thanks, Jay. So I, I want to talk about the state of Israel. When I was a kid, went to Hebrew school in New York. Um, and went to, you know, all those classes about the uh, the kids in the short pants on the kibbutzim, uh, you know, dancing and singing and and doing creative agriculture in, in the desert, making the desert bloom. Yeah. Uh, I became a Zionist. And I became, you know, imbued with the notion that the state of Israel was a miracle. It came out of the Holocaust. It came out of the Second World War. And everyone there had a story. And this was in the 1950s. And so, you know, now when you see this happening and you see the government, uh, you know, is kind of in its own chaos under Netanyahu, uh, when you see these, these collaboration going on between, uh, you know, Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas and, and for that matter, Putin, I believe Putin's involved, um, then you say, this has never happened before. This level of atrocity, this level of planning, funding, weaponry, you know, and an outright, outright murder has never happened before. Or civilians in their homes, in their beds, are sitting at the kitchen table. It's not the same thing as fighting Israeli troops on a battlefield. Uh, it's, it's murder. It's mass murder. So you say... Can Israel defend itself? I mean, some people, some people in the kibbutzim there in the south, they never did get help. They waited, hiding for hours and hours and days before anybody came to help them. Now, the Israelis were really off guard here in so many ways. And I'm not, I'm not here to criticize their intelligence or anything like that. I just, it raises the question of whether Israel can survive whether the state of Israel that we learned about in Hebrew school in the 50s 
And those kids in the short pants growing creative agriculture in the kibbutzim being attacked every now and then, you know, across the border um, and surviving. The state of Israel has survived all these years. And it, that's also a miracle. But miracles have a way of not, not sustaining themselves. My question to you is, are you concerned about the future of the state of Israel, as I am? I am not, Jay. I disagree with you. I think the state of Israel will survive. I think the knee-jerk reaction that you and I have right now, the anger that we have, that we want to punch back, and you know what happened with the intelligence failure, and, and how did they get through? And uh, I, I think a lot of it is because Israel has always been known as the strongest power in the Middle East. And uh, they maybe took too much for granted. They didn't realize that Hamas could do their own disinformation campaign and make, make themselves look like they're going to sit back and not do anything, when in reality, they were planning this in my opinion for at least a year or two. There's no way they could have gone through with this without, without major planning and without assistance. Now, I know Iran has said that they have nothing to do with it. Syria, Lebanon has said, I honestly believe that Hamas could not have done this without their assistance. There's no way. Their money, their technology, uh, our money maybe was, you know, was involved in this. But, you know, that's for another conversation. Your question was, can Israel survive? I have, uh, this year, Sue and I spent uh, two weeks there. Uh, in in uh, Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in the Kazimersky kibbutz called Ein Shamer. Uh, uh, we, every year we go back, and I can tell you, there's no doubt in my mind that when it comes to survival, there is no fitter nation in the world to survive than Israel. This has brought Israelis together. I mean, you know what happened with Netanyahu. I mean, I was swearing at Netanyahu three months ago because my airplane couldn't get off the ground. You know, I was stuck in Tel Aviv because there were strikes. Or hundreds of thousands of kids were striking. But those hundreds of thousands today are dressed in their uniform. They're at the border. They're ready to invade. And I think that's that's the one thing about Israelis when it comes to the defense of Israel, we are all there. By the way, I just wanted to tell you, three Kazimerskis, my brother, my nephew, and my niece, who are all doctors, are going to Israel. They're they're going to help out. Good. You know, there's more than just those those uh, young men and women amassing at the border ready to do a land invasion if they are told to do that. But I suggest to you, in being there and being willing to follow those orders, they also understand that it's life and death for them, that a certain number of them will die in battle. And yet, they are still there. You're right, Jay. The, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Israeli uh, strength that you're talking about, their inner, their inner sanctum of Israel above all, that Israel has to survive, allows them to do what they have to do. I, I, I can only tell you, you know, going there and being with the people of Israel and, and being with the Mossad and, and studying in Israel and you know, I've done business in Israel, as you already know, and and it's 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 an amazing country, Jay. And I think uh, their ability to do what they do in business, their ability to do what they do in technology, this war will end. It's not. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. But it, the answer to your question is, Israel will survive. In my opinion, there is no doubt whatsoever. How dependent is Israel on, on the U.S., on the U.S. government, on the administration, on Congress for funding? And uh, when I say dependent, I'm asking uh, whether uh, they need uh, they need cooperation, funding, resources, what have you, support from the United States in, in order to survive. And, and do you think there's questions about whether they'll get that? Uh, I don't. I, I think that um, uh, both the Democrats and the Republicans, except for, for, the, for those idiots in the squad, 
you know, those four dumb asses, if you'll excuse my expression, who, uh, who, who think that the Palestinians are all perfect and the Israelis are all bad. The Democrats and the Republicans are 100% behind Israel, and they will support them. Uh, uh, don't forget, we have another issue. We have Ukraine that is looking for major support as well. So funding-wise, armament-wise, uh, militarily, intelligence-wise, I think U.S. is behind 100%. I don't think we'll have a problem. I think the, the most important thing right now is to limit the damage to see if we could get a humanitarian corridor so that we can get the hostage, trade the hostages. You've heard the latest is trade the hostages for power, food, electricity, that kind of stuff. But I'd like to see a humanitarian corridor open up, let the Egyptians be part of the process, make sure that Hamas doesn't get through to the Egyptian side. We go in and clean up Gaza, let the Palestinian people who want to come back, who want to live peacefully, come back. I want one more chance at it, Jay. I know this has happened in the in the Seven Day War. It happened 10 years ago. It, it, we keep going back and forth on this, but I'd like to do it. I think we need to clean out Hamas, get rid of them. Uh, Netanyahu said something about uh, Hamas is like ISIS. He just said that the other day. And you remember how the U.S. took out ISIS? We, we didn't stop at killing. We went all the way through to make sure we got rid of ISIS. And I think at this stage, I feel we have to get rid of Hamas. There's, the straw has broken the camel's back. That's it. It's over now. Hamas has to be destroyed completely. I agree. It's a combination of um, hostages for um, food, water, electric, right. and fuel. But, um, you know, the thing is that if Egypt has said up to this point, no, you can't you can't come back uh, into the Sinai. We're not going to let you back in. Uh, and I think the reason is they're afraid that among those Palestinians who, uh, who you know, uh, come back uh, into the Sinai and into Egypt, there's going to be Hamas there. There are going to be yeah. militants who make lots of trouble for Egypt. Egypt cannot afford to have militants either. Uh, they have plenty of experience with that. And That's so that exactly been... what I'm hoping for, Jay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, my thought when I heard about the humanitarian corridor, I said to myself, Egypt won't want Hamas guys in there. They'll make sure that whoever gets in, they will, they will somehow figure out who who was a real uh, a, a Gazian citizen rather than a Hamas leader. And don't forget, if, if you cut off the head of the snake, there's no more snake. It's the heads that you have to get off. The soldiers will disappear, in my opinion. So well, the Israelis so have intelligence on who the leadership is of Hamas, and they should be sharing that with the Egyptians so the Egyptians can make a working border to uh, filter out the uh, Hamas leadership anyway. They will. They yeah. will, Jay. It, uh, you know, my feeling has always been doing business in Israel. It, uh, they are they're, they're excellent in communication. Excellent. And I've always felt that when I do business in Israel, I can do it quicker there than I can do anywhere in the world because they tell you exactly what you know what's happening. There's no beating around the bush. And that's why Israel is so powerful when it comes to telecommunications. Uh, yeah. it, uh, it, it is one of the strongest countries in the world when it comes to medical devices. It has more patents than all of the other countries in, in the Middle East and Europe put together. Uh, Israel is a very, very special country, not because I'm Jewish, but because as a business consultant, I can tell you doing business in Israel is one of the pleasures that I have in my life. And the life in Israel is what I'm hoping will continue. And the people are sweet. We see, we, need, we know them more now, don't we? The world knows them as victims over the past few days. And I want to say also, you talk about technology. Well, I would say Hamas has to deal on cell phones. Um, that's the way it works. And what does that remind you of? Does it remind you of Pegasus? Does it remind, remind you of the, <laughs> the <Yeah>. Israeli? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, thank heaven, as, as this catastrophe continues, we're going to remind ourselves all the time that it's going to get better, that we have to suffer through what's going on now. But, you know, you know, I, I'm sure you, well, maybe you don't, but I've had cancers removed in my face, melanomas. And you know what they do? They never take out just the amount that they see. They go all around to take it out because they want to make sure that they've got it all. That's what Israel is doing now. They want to be sure they get all of the Hamas leaders, not just the three or four or 10 or 20. They need to get them all, and they will get them all. I don't think they're going to stop until all of them are gone. Yeah, and that's, and that's different do. too, isn't it? They're, they're going to be more aggressive about it. One other thing that came up in the interview on MSNBC with Cory Booker was this. Booker believes that all these players, the ones, the, the Hamas and the supporters of Hamas, would like to disrupt Israel's efforts to establish diplomatic relations with some of the Arab countries, like, for example, Saudi Arabia. Um, and indeed, you know, over the past few days, it's clear they disrupted everything, uh, you know, in the Middle East, including our discussions with Saudi Arabia. Um, but query, do you think we'll be able to revisit those discussions? That's why Anthony Blinken is there. Uh, in order to assure the continuation of, of, of peace talks, uh, of diplomatic relations between Israel and, and countries that might otherwise be enemies of Israel, um, do you think it'll work? I think Corey is right uh, that, it, you know, there was a piece of the puzzle to make sure that Israel becomes a bad guy again in the world of the Arab nations. But I think I, I think it'll take a little bit of time, Jay. I, I, Sue and I were in Abu Dhabi. We were in Dubai. We saw Israeli companies. We saw, uh, as a matter of fact, I met with a coalition of Israeli companies in Dubai doing business. And I see the United Arab Emirates and I see Oman. And even though they are not friends of Israel, they want to do business with Israel. And guess what? Money talks. And I think that we are going to see a better, it's, it's, I mean, we're set back, there's no doubt about it, but we will see some type of affiliation between the other countries in the Middle East and Israel. This Palestinian issue has been there for a long time, Jay. And, uh, uh, you know, we've got a few countries, Egypt, Jordan, et cetera, who recognize Israel. Recognize Israel and you watch. Business will go back and forth between those countries. Knock wood. The other, the last point I want to ask you about are, are these uh, kids under BDS, you know, BDS on the college campuses in this yeah. country. Actually, it's not only in this country, it's in Canada and various countries, and I think it's probably in Europe, just completely anti-Semitic and uh, anti-Zionist and anti-Israel. And they're busy, busy lately. Uh, and I believe they're part of this whole uh, letter signing campaign, you know, where, where students uh, sign letters uh, supporting Hamas and, and massacres and the like. Um, so what do you say to these kids now? I know, you know, it would take a lifetime to retrain them, to reorganize their brain cells. But what do you say to them now? You know, you have Harvard, you have Yale, you have Columbia, you have Penn. And I probably could go on with half a dozen more of the big, you know, five-star schools in the country. You have Stanford. Yes, absolutely. Stanford, thank you. Um, so what, what do you say to them? Because it, it demonstrates a, a huge weakness in our educational system. What are they studying that they would be so dead wrong? I know, you know, so I'm asking you, you know, what do you say to them? And, and you can begin with, hey, schmuck, what's wrong with you? But you don't have to say that. <laughs> Jay, Jay, we, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, your, your, your feeling of, you know, we've got to change that system. Jay, we cannot. We live in a democracy. People have a right to think what they want to think. I mean, we've had the Ku Klux Klan here for how many years? You know, we have, it's a, it's, a, it's a system in the United States and the Western world that allows people to say what they want to say. A lot of them are only doing it because they want attention. They don't even know what they're talking about. They want attention, but they don't want to admit they signed the letter. Ah, I love that part. But you see, that could be one of the aspects of social media 
that might help us in the end because we can find out who those guys are. And when you print those names, you know what they say? Oh, that's not what I really meant. I didn't know. That's what these Harvard kids said. That's not, I mean, these are Harvard educated students and they say they don't know what they signed. And they, all of a sudden they're backtracking. And I think as we do that, as we try to open up this conversation with these people who are anti-Semitic, especially the BDS, uh, they will start to realize that they're going to be on the hot seat, not just because they're, they're anti-Israel, but they're going to be on the hot seat because they are thinking a totally undemocratic way. And you can't do that in the United States and Canada and the Western world. I mean, I, I don't know if you realize, but in Germany, you say something anti-Semitic, you're going to jail. That's how strong it is in Germany. Now, we can't do that here in the U.S., but I'll tell you, I think that it, more and more, as 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 people uh, say things, they're going to have to put their name to it, or people will find out what their name to it. I was hosting an ADL meeting here uh, about a month and a half ago, and they came and I hosted, uh, I think it was the Western uh, leadership of the ADL, and we had... Uh, I think it was 20 people at the at the meeting and Senator Hemmings, you remember Fred Hemmings, sure. he was there and he is the he is more Zionistic than you and me. <laughs> he believes so much that Israel is the foundation of what the Western world should be all about. He is truly a great Zionist. And Fred taught us something at that meeting. He made us understand you don't have to be Jewish to believe that you're a Zionist. And he made us understand that in his thinking, the Jewish world came from centuries. It's the oldest tradition. It's the oldest biblical tradition in the world. The Arabs didn't come forth until 300 AD. So obviously we're a lot older than they are. We've suffered more than any other, any other religion in the world. But yet we survived, Jay. And your question about will Israel survive? I say yes. Uh, will will democracy survive? Will we be able to 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 work something out so we can get uh, 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 working with the other Arab countries? I say yes. I am I'm so very positive. I hate what's going on. I I'm trying not to get emotional about it, but believe me, uh, we are going to work through this, and we're going to be stronger in the end. Not would Seymour. <laughs> Would um, <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful what you have done, and I think it's your your thinking is advanced and refined and nuanced, uh, and I sure appreciate you coming on our show to to talk about it. Um, there will be other developments that my my guess is they will be disturbing also, um, and hopefully you're right. Uh, hopefully the Israelis have a a kind of special bond. Maybe this helps them bond up after the trouble with Netanyahu, um, yeah. and and maybe and maybe you know that abiding, uh, what do you want to call it, creativity and and um, you know ability to solve problems uh, will will pervade. I'm I'm worried, I'm I'm afraid, but at the end of my tunnel there is a little light along those lines, as you have articulated. Thank you so From much. Your Sam. mouth. From your mouth to God's ears, Jake. Yes, Seymour. Thank Aloha. you so much. Aloha.